Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Savas Parastatidis from External Research. And it is my great, great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Paul Watson from Newcastle University, as it's now called, uh, from, from the UK. Uh, I know Paul, uh, I've known him for, uh, as we said yesterday, for 13 years now, yeah, yeah. since 95, 96, 95. And Paul was my PhD supervisor, my mentor, and, uh, and then uh, my, my boss at uh, the UK Science uh, Program, uh, UK Science Center uh, in, in, in Newcastle. And, uh, he's been uh, fantastic. Uh, he's been a fantastic commander. I've learned so much uh, uh, next to him, and uh, and it's always a pleasure seeing him and uh, and uh, talking with him. So uh, I'm not gonna say a story. I just want to to allow uh, uh, Paul uh, to start. Uh, he's gonna talk to us about uh, the wonderful work that they are doing around cloud services uh, for science. Okay. Thanks, Alice. So it's a pleasure to uh, be here again. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project called the Kalman Project, which, um, which is one of the big UK science projects, which, so, as you probably know, Tony kicked off the UK science program and ran it very successfully for many years. And every now and again, they fund some large projects which try to see whether we can apply e-science techniques in particular areas, and this is, this is one of them. So um, it's split into two strands, really. So half is going to be about this particular new informatics application. I should say that I'm not a, I'm not a neuroscientist before, in case anybody uh, starts asking me difficult questions. Uh, so I'm, I'm a computer scientist, so I pick up what I can from the neuroscientists in the, in the project. And the, the particular approach we've taken in this, um, in this area is, is the cloud computing approach. When we started, we didn't know it was called cloud computing, but that seems to be what everybody calls it uh, these days. So we'll talk about how we're dealing with the the problems of neuroinformatics by applying a cloud computing paradigm. So the reason we got interested in this was because, um, although I don't know much about neuroscience, I've always been fascinated by uh, the way in which the, the brain worked. And so I've been chatting to neuroscientists for, for m many years. And uh, we, all of us in the project, believe that this is the last great informatics challenge. So uh, physicists will always be keen on finding the something about a smaller particle than the ones we understand at the, at the moment. But in terms of human size uh, endeavor, then understanding more about how the brain works, uh, I think is really important. When I, when I started on this, I went and bought a book on neuroscience. So you can go to any, uh, any textbook around it, any textbook shop around the university and buy books. And they're always about so thick. And you sit down and you start to, to read them. And uh, after about 100 pages, your own brain starting to hurt very much, and you're starting to flick through faster and faster to get to the chapter called How the Brain Works, and uh, you never find it. And uh, one of the neuroscientists in the project told me, well, you know, that's why we need to have projects like this one, because we want to be able to write that chapter. So one of the, the, the big hopes of this project is that by pursuing these sorts of, uh, th this sort of work, somebody can write that chapter on how the, how the brain works. So... Um, our hope is that we'll learn something about computer science, because obviously there's, there's many things that the brain can do that computers aren't actually particularly good at, like in image recognition, for example. Um, learn something about biology and, of course, medicine. So a lot of the, uh, the drugs uh, that, that, are, that are used operate on the, on the brain. So hopefully, by understanding more about the, the brain, we can make advances in all of these areas. And here's a... I think I have to click to, to kick this off. So this is, uh, this is to show you the sort of data that people are collecting and operating on. So this is, uh, these are some ganglion cells. So they, these sit between photoreceptors and the optical nerve. So they're mediating information that's coming in um, uh, through, the, through the retina. And uh, what you're seeing there is these, these, these dots, the colored dots, so these are active neurons. So you can see waves of activity sweeping through uh, this part of the brain. And... The, this, is in a, this is from a, a, a retina of an unborn turtle. And uh, so what they think is happening here is, so there's no actual light getting to, the, getting to the retina. So what they think is that a lot of the brain is very plastic. 
And so what they think is that this is part of the process of wiring up the connections in the brain so that it's ready for when the turtle's born so it can interpret the world, world around it. So, but they're not really, um, they're not exactly sure that this is the case. So they collect lots of data like this and then they try to under, understand what it really, really means. And there's a surprisingly large number of neuroscientists around the world collecting this sort of data. So 100,000, which is in much higher than I would have, uh, would have guessed. And they collect information at, you can see at all sorts of different, different levels from the, uh, right down to the genomic, right up to the, to the behavioral. Um, and this creates a lot of problems. So at the moment, although there's lots of data collected by all these different scientists, uh, unfortunately, it's very rarely shared. And as you can imagine, a lot of this uh, data is very expensive to collect. So I'll show you some data in a, a few slides time that's collected from human patients. And there's only one of the operations that allows you to collect these data uh, takes place in, in the hospital in Newcastle every month. And so they collect this data, but at the moment it's not really particularly well reused. And the, the reasons for that are that um, it tends to be kept in a proprietary format. So every manufacturer of, of kit that you use to, uh, to collect this data has their own formats for the, for the data. And so labs stick with a particular manufacturer and write all sorts of analysis routines that only work with that manufacturer's uh, data formats. So it's actually very difficult then for data to be transferred from one group to another and for people who are writing analysis routines, they can't write generic analysis routines you could use on all sorts of, all sorts of data. It tends to be very specialised to the particular kit they have in their own lab. Um, and as a result of this you get much less collaboration than you might expect. So neuroscientists uh, are aware of the fact that they have different skills, different expertise, some of them are better at doing the experiments than they are at the analysis. And so really if they could collaborate and share data and share the analysis routines, they could make quite a lot of progress, but they're not able to do that at the moment. And uh, I just put this in because this isn't, uh, neuroscience are very clever people in my experience, so it's not just because they're, uh, they don't really know what they're, they're doing. This seems to, to me to be a general problem in science. So as you move around uh, working on e-science projects in lots of different areas, you keep seeing this, this again and again. And, uh, I came across Jeffrey Bowker once who talked about his, sci his standard scientific model and he says that science uh, takes place in three stages. So first of all, people collect data and then they publish papers on the data and then they gradually lose the, the original data. And this, this wasn't just a bar anecdote. If you go to this paper, he's analysed the way in which uh, data is collected and, and used in science. And this creates all sorts of problems with... Uh, so, so the idea of science, one of the great things about it, is supposed to be the ability to replicate uh, experiments. But actually, if you haven't got the data, and a lot of the data that we use now is created by programs rather than just the original source data. If you haven't got uh, this data, then how can you replicate these experiments? How can you reuse the data? How can you take other people's data and see whether your analysis routines, uh, when you apply to their data, give you the same results as in, in your own data? So. So this is really um, calling back not just neuroscience but lots of sciences. And I would claim um, you, you get the same for codes in science. So codes go through the same stages. People write codes to apply to data. They publish papers on it and then they gradually lose the original codes and that has the same, uh, has the same problems. So although the, there's various attempts in uh, a number of sciences to allow people to share data, what we decided to do in the Carmen project was also try to get them to share the analysis routines as well. So we're trying to trying to attack both, both problems. And so, sort of Carmen to the, to the rescue. So this is the sort of mission statement of Carmen to allow these scientists, wherever they are, to collaborate and share their analysis code, their data, and their, and their expertise. So this was, the, um, this was what we uh, put forward to a, a committee of people, including Darren, in fact, I seem to remember, who thankfully decided to, to fund us. So it's quite a big project. The, um, the computer science is done by, uh, I'm at Newcastle and Jim Austin's group at, at York, and then there's neuroscientists around the country who are collecting data and want to use this system to share and analyse that data. And there's a few companies, including Microsoft, who have uh, signed up to support the, the project as well. Within the project, the focus is on neural activity. So I said there's lots of different sorts of data that people are interested in. So neural activity is about, um, so they put one or more electrodes into the brain, and then you get readings like this. And because you can't put an electrode into a specific neuron, then the information you're getting is from a whole set of neurons around where the electrode is. So the first thing that they have to do is what they call uh, spike sorting, 
where they try to work out uh, the set of neurons which have uh, contributed to this signal that you're getting out from the, from the electrode. And there's various techniques to do that. And then they have some way of working out where the spikes are because uh, although people aren't really sure how the brain processes information, there's a lot of evidence that it's, uh, the, these spikes are the way in which information is, is passed through the different regions of the brain and, and processed uh, by the neurons. And the idea is basically to try and understand what on earth uh, these, these spikes mean. And that's a, that's a very difficult problem. And the reason why there isn't a chapter at the moment on how the, how the brain works is because uh, basically you're, you're sampling. So because you can stick one electrode on nowadays, uh, an array of electrodes into the brain, you're, you're, you're sampling from a set of neurons in one particular part of the brain. You don't know what the connectivity of those neurons are, so you don't know what's connected to what. You don't know whether you're getting the information from all the neurons. You don't know whether the information you're getting is specific to uh, the particular place where you, you've inserted the electrodes or whether it's more general. So it's very, it's very difficult. I sometimes, um, I sometimes draw the analogy. Imagine if we uh, were trying to work, understand how integrated circuits work. And all we had was a, uh, was, a, was a probe that we could stick at various points into a, into a VLSI circuit and uh, on the back of that we had to work out how a pension processor worked and it's a, it's a, it's a problem of that sort of, uh, that sort of magnitude. So here's an, here's an example just to, um, to, to show you about how data might be expensive to collect uh, and we really want to share it. So this is um, from a, some work that's done at Newcastle in the, uh, in the hospital there. So um, every now and again, so roughly 12 times a year, there's a patient who uh, presents themselves at the hospital. They've got terrible problems with epilepsy and it can't be controlled by drugs. And so as a last resort, they remove a part of the brain in order to try and uh, cure the problem or at least to, to reduce it. And in order to do that, they need to work out which part of the brain to, to remove. Obviously, that's very, it's very important that you remove the, the right part, no more or, or no less. So what they do is they, they open up the brain and they use electrodes in order to gather information and they move the electrodes around until they've located the part that they think causes the problem and then they, they, they remove it and then they analyze the, the slice they've removed while it lives so they can oxygenate it and keep it in drugs for somewhere between minutes to hours and gather some information. So they can do this once a month and they collect the data and then largely the group that's collected it uses that data but as I've said the, the problem is that it's not particularly shared so this, it's not as if it's easy for another group somewhere else to take that data and apply their own analysis routines to it or to combine it with data from other hospitals. So, um, so this is a warning. So I know some people don't, uh, don't like seeing uh, medical photographs. So the next two slides are going to show an exposed human brain. So look away now if you, uh, if you don't want to see it. I, I, I've started to go to neuroscience conferences and they don't give you any warnings there. So sometimes you can almost jump out of your seat. But here we go. So, so this is the part of the brain where they, um, where they think the problem is, so they've removed that part of the skull to prepare it. And then you can see there the, there's two sets of four electrons being placed on the brain and the surgeon will move those around and look at the signals coming out and when they think they've located the, the area then they'll remove that, uh, that part, of the, part of the brain. Okay, so there, right. We're past it now so anybody not looking can, uh, can look again. There's no more uh, slides like that. And uh, this is the information that they, they're getting out of the, the brain. And actually for the, uh, for the part that causes the problem with epilepsy, it's usually what you get is you get a part where there's, there's not really very much activity, but in the surrounding areas there's lots of activity. So it, it's almost as if the part of the brain which is causing the problem blocks the flow of signals around that part of the brain. So you, you see them all building up around that area and then a very uh, dead area, which is the part that they remove. Okay, there's another one. So, when it came to trying to work out what we needed to do to, uh, to address this, then the um, key thing here is to be able to share. So, sharing data and code, uh, as I've said, we're trying to share the analysis routines as well as just the data that's collected from the experiments. Um, and uh, the capacities can be quite large. So, um, so, I've said vast, so I guess to a company like Microsoft, 100 terabytes isn't very big, but it is to us compared to lots of other uh, uh, e-science projects. So, we'll collect that from the scientists in the project within the next couple of years. Um, each, th one of the problems is that as these techniques come on, then you get more and more data collected. So, when we started the project, started writing the proposal, single electrode recording was quite common. 
And then multiple electrode recording came in, so that moved from, say, one electrode to about 60, and now they're going up to about 500 of these electrodes that they stream from all the time. And then the video techniques, which I showed you, that gives you a factor of 10 more, more data. So it went from a few tens of megabytes per experiment up to gigabytes, or even in some of the bigger experiments, terabytes in a, in a single experiment in the, course of, in the course of two or three years. And this is only going to increase as these video techniques start to, start to take over. Um, and once you've got that sort of data, of course, you have to analyze it, and this can take a very long time. So I had someone in my office last week who estimated that their analysis routine would take half a year to run on some of these, uh, some of these uh, data sets that we'd, uh, that we'd collected. So, so you need to, uh, need to be able to share very large amounts of data. You need to have some way of, of running these analysis routines on it. So we came up with this cloud architecture for it. So the idea is that if you've got a cloud to somewhere just out there over the internet where people can upload their data, then it's easy for them to share it because they, uh, they can just change permissions on it and other people can see it. It doesn't have to be physically transferred. Um, and key, so once they've uploaded their data, they can also upload services. So this was the idea. So um, it would be nice to have a fixed set of services that would support the needs of the neuroscientists. We'd just provide them out there in the cloud. They would upload their data. They would choose what to to do, run it and analyze the data and, and visualize the results. In practice, of course, being, being scientists, what happens is they're driving into work on a morning and they come up with a new algorithm and they want to code that up and apply it to all the data in the system. So we needed to have somewhere so that users could not just upload data, could also upload code to, to run to analyze their, their data as well. Uh, and then, so once you've once you've got your data up there and the services are up there, then users can run analyses. So the idea is they run the analyses out there somewhere just using a web browser and they can visualize the, the results. So that's, that's quite a common cloud sort of model uh, these days. Perhaps the thing which is a bit different about it is the need to be able to dynamically upload services to run on the, run on the data. What exactly are they uploading when they upload this analysis? Is it a PM? Is it a... Well, um, yeah, I'll talk a bit more about that later. But um, we, so we, we get people to wrap everything they do as web services because we wanted to have some sort of standard for it. And we can actually cope with having the, the web services in a VM, but we can cope with it in lots of different ways as well. So uh, war files, .NET assemblies. So, so as long as we've got some sort of deployer for it, then, then we can handle it. But the only as I say, the only restriction we have is it's got to be wrapped as a web service. So we've got some sort of... A uh, common way to deal with it, to put security around it, to compose it with other services. Um, and so there's quite a lot of interest, as you know, in cloud computing. So, so one approach to this would be to just say, well, we'll, um, we'll provide some low-level storage and compute service. So this is kind of the, uh, I suppose, the Amazon approach, where you can buy storage on S3 and you can run things in, in EC2. And then we could say, OK, and then you just write your science apps uh, above that. Um, and we didn't want to do that. What we wanted to do is to try to think about, well, are there any services that we could factor out, that we could provide once, and then people could just use them? So people could move up the value chain, could just write specific services at the top. So based on the um, last five or six years of running e-science projects, we sat down and thought about, well, what were these common, what were these common services that we'd want to, want to provide? And so, so we rejected that option, and basically we ended up with, with this. So these are the services that we, we came up with in the cloud. So this is basically our, our cloud here, and there's a set of services in there. We run it on our own cluster at the moment. I'll talk later on about why we don't run it on Amazon or or wherever, but we've got our own cluster to run it on. Um, and so if I go through the services, so you won't be surprised that we need somewhere to, to store data. So uh, the raw data goes into files because it's, uh, it's basic time series data. And then we also have a, a database, in fact, a SQL server that we can use to store secondary data that we've produced from those files. Um, and then we have to have some way of describing these files because the scientists have to be able to look for data that was collected in particular sorts of experiments uh, or by particular groups. So we've got a, a, a metadata store in there, and when scientists upload their data from their web browsers over the far end over there, then they fill in forms to describe the, uh, the metadata. We've got some ontologies that we've devised, so we use some general ontologies 
from uh, biology, which are used basically just to describe the experimental process. And then there's some specific ontologies that we've had to uh, produce for electrophysiological data because none existed uh, uh, before the project started. So, so we end up with your data and your, your metadata here. And then, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but we've also got a repository for the services that people have uploaded. Um, and then we've got uh, a cluster, and when people want to run these services on the data, we can take the services in deployable form from this repository and deploy it on one or more nodes and, and run it in the cluster. Um, we've got a workflow enactment engine because workflows have been successful in lots of different e-science projects. They're not particularly well used by neuroscientists at the moment, but our experience with biologists is that they're a valuable way for people to uh, compose together uh, different analysis codes so people don't have to write a, 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 a siloed routine which does everything. People who are good at visualization can write visualization routines and compose it with somebody else who's good at statistical analysis and compose it with somebody else who's good at spike sorting routines. So workflow allows people to combine these processes together to, to, and, and to share them. And um, so we wanted to run that in the, in the cloud as well because obviously the danger is if you've got your workflow enactment engine out as is commonly the case on the user's desktop, then all the data would have to fly backwards and forwards and it would take a very long time if you were trying to analyze uh, terabytes of data. Um, so at the moment we're using Taverna. So that's, that's uh, largely because uh, historically that's the one that we've used and got the expertise with. Um, but we're not, uh, we're not completely tied to it. We could move to anything else as long as it would run in the, in the cloud remotely. Sorry, Steve. Well, yes, we might. We'd have to apply for permission, but I guess we uh, we could get that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Let's have a look. Ah, screen saver, I think. So, um, yeah. So then we've got a registry which allows people to search for the data and the analysis services that they that they're interested in. And we've got a security wrapper for the system. So um, neuroscientists, like lots of scientists, aren't the sort of people who are just happy with the idea of sharing all of their data as soon as it comes out of the experiment. So they really want to get those nature and science papers written and published before they allow um, anybody else to, to see it. Um, we've, we've done lots of requirements analysis with all these different groups of neuroscientists that we've, uh, we've got involved in the project. And it's quite interesting that the first reaction when you say, and once the data is uploaded, who would you like to be able to see it? The, the initial reaction is always me. Uh, no, the, the, and then they think, well, and yeah, and maybe my students and perhaps uh, later my collaborators and so on. But really, you need quite a, a fine-grained security system running there before anybody would consider uploading any data into the, into the cloud. So we've, we've got a system where once you've uploaded the data, you can decide who's allowed to see it, and you can then change it over time as you allow more and more people to, to have access to it. Um, and then we've got the, the um, people accessing this over the web on the, on the, le on the left-hand side. Roger? I'm curious why you didn't put a provenance service there as well. Oh. People could capture what they did and what they yeah. did last week. So that's, um, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a very good point. So we have actually got somebody working on a provenance service, but we didn't commit to it at the beginning of the project because we'd never written one before. We couldn't find one that we'd... Uh, uh, that, that was just available to drop into the system. But y you're right, that, that'll be a very valuable addition to these set of services. Yeah. If somebody created one and put it in your service repository, could it just use then the provenance, or is it something that would have to be built in? Uh, I think it would have to be built in um, because it has, to, it has to have probes into all the other things going on. So every time you run a workflow, you want it to record who ran it, what the workflow was, which services are called, and so on. So I think it would have to be a one of the sort of first class services rather than the, these analysis services here which are then choreographing using the workflow and the provenance is recording what actually happened. Yeah. Okay. So I'll say a little bit about um, uh, one of these things which actually picks up on the question I had earlier. So, so this system that we've had for a few years now which, um, which allows us to have this code repository, so this thing called called Dinosaur, which actually Savas worked on in, the, in its early stages. So the basic idea is that we wrap code as web services. So we stick to uh, WSI web services because we want to have them uh, to be interoperable and we don't want to uh, 
have to go back to everybody in a year or two's time and ask them to change to whatever the latest new web service standard is. So WSI seems quite conservative and seems to do what we want. So we stick to that. And it means that the internals aren't uh, important. So people can write services in Java. A lot of neuroscientists write in MATLAB. And um, this proved to be quite a, quite a pain for us because um, of the licensing model. So um, we had one person technically looking at how we might run MATLAB in the cloud, another person reading the small print of all of the, the MATLAB documentation to make sure we wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be imprisoned or fined for, for doing this. But we think we've, uh, we've cracked both of, uh, both of those. So there's a MATLAB compiler that you can use, and uh, when you, once you produce the output of that, you, you can run it without a license. So that's what we, that's what we do. So we can support MATLAB services as well as as well as any others. And the key thing is just that um, whatever you've got, then you have a deployer for it. So once you've got this service in your repository, you just need somewhere to deploy it. So uh, we've, we've done virtual machines. I think Savas did this one many, many years ago, the virtual PC, PC one. The .NET assemblies we can, uh, we can also deploy. Um, and even Jim Gray once suggested to us that we should be able to deploy services in a database. So we, we've done that as well. So we can deploy services right into a uh, SQL Server as well, if that makes sense, to save having to transfer data in and out of the in and out of the database. And so this is the way it, this is the way it works in a bit more detail. So the first time you call a service, so basically all services have endpoints, just ordinary service endpoints. So as far as the client's concerned, it doesn't see any difference from from a normal service, and um, what happens is that the client sends the, the SOAP message to this, um, to this endpoint, which is uh, owned by a web service provider, and it then sends it to somewhere, it can be anywhere, where we have these things called host providers, and they're in charge of the compute resources, and uh, it's not necessarily the case that the service has to be deployed at the time when it arrives at the host provider, because the web service provider, when it gets the the request, it inserts into that request the handle of a place where a host provider can go to get a deployable version of the service and deploy it if necessary. So that's gonna, what's going to happen in this case. So this is for service uh, S4, and S4 isn't deployed on any of these nodes. So a request goes out to the service repository. A deployable version of the service comes back and is deployed on a node, and then the, the request can go to that node and run, and then the result returned to the, to the client. So basically, it's a way so that we can build up this repository of services. Yeah. What is the node? Oh, so that would just be a, uh, a processor. Yeah. So, t so uh, in our system at the moment, this is a cluster. So these are each of the, the nodes in the cluster. What platforms are you offering? Like, I mean, you said you have .NET, you have Java, you have database. What, are you offering Linux and Windows and MySQL and SQL and, and all these things, or are you trying to? Um, so the the cluster at the moment is a Linux cluster, um, but the infrastructure which supports Dinosaur could be ported to anything. I mean, Savas a few years ago got a part of it working on .NET quite, quite over a weekend. But so it's always over a weekend with Savas. So you guys are running Mono then? The no, that one was uh, that was a native implementation. That was, uh, yeah, but uh, this one no, this this could be written. I don't think they support uh, more. No. No, not at the moment. We've not tried it with Mono. I guess I guess we could, but so it's sort of Java. It is, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so you, I you said you were supporting .NET assemblies. Oh yeah, well we have yeah we we have done in the past, oh, but okay. in in the current uh, system then uh, we couldn't uh, run those at the moment, except that you could put them into a virtual machine, and then we could deploy those and run them. So so that would work, but yeah, at the moment the host provider. So this is the component that you'd have to port to another sort of machine. So at the moment, this runs on a, a Linux platform in the Carmen project. Um, once, once you've deployed the service, then it, um, for subsequent calls, then they just get routed to a deployed version of the, of the service. So there's no overhead every time you, uh, you call the service. It just gets... Uh, uh, gets sent to that node which, which is running the service. So one of the attractions of this is that when we started to use virtual machines, um, things like .war files or .NET assemblies, you might end up with 10, 20 megabytes representing your service. As soon as you go to virtual machines, it goes up and can be 5, 6, uh, 7 gigabytes. It takes quite a long time to move these uh, onto a node and, and deploy it. But 
the attraction of this way of doing it is that once it's deployed, you don't have to move it every time. It just you can stay there, and so you the cost of deploying it gets aggregated across all of the different invocations that you make to that service once it's once it's there. So, so does the system have any understanding of cost in the way that you know time to deploy you know an instance of something in the event you do have to you know get remove it from the host or yeah. So we've done some work on that. Um, Let's have a. After this, I'll come back to that in one, in one slide's time, Darren. So I thought it was this slide, but it's actually the, the next one. So this just gives you an idea of, the, of uh, some costs. So this was, um, this was where we were investigating what it would be like if we didn't deploy the services close to the data. So this would be the case where CALM was just a data repository and people were running the analysis routines on their local system. And this is some tuples. Each, each of these tuples was a, was a few hundred bytes coming from this database and then there's analysis service. So this purple line shows what happens if the analysis service was remote from the database. And you can see that uh, for this particular um, analysis routine, you're paying a high price for transferring the, the data. So as the, uh, this is logarithmic, so as the number of tuples requested uh, goes up, you, you, you re it's really starting to cost you an awful lot to move the data around. With Dinosaur, when you switch Dinosaur on, so then you move the analysis routine close to the database, and you can see that the, the cost drops uh, considerably. So this yellow line is the cost the first time you call the service using Dinosaur. So this includes the cost of, of deployment. And then after that, this is the, the cost once it's deployed. So, so this would be the, the cost for the second and subsequent calls of the, of the service down here. So, uh, so you can see you do pay a cost in the, in the deployment. But once, you, once you've done that, then the overheads, as it turns out, are actually quite low of... Uh, of having dinosaur in the system. Right, so here's, here's the answer to Darren's question. So, um, so we played around with various algorithms. This is the most sophisticated one that we've tried. So this is the one which tries to keep the, uh, the response time constant for a service as you increase the number of requests. And so it does that by monitoring the time that it's taking to process each request and then deploy multiple versions of the service in order to give you uh, uh, to, to, to give you more uh, concurrent um, services which are able to process requests of this type. So if you start um, over here, so this is quite a low arrival rate, and we've got uh, two processes here which are able to process the requests, and the response time is down here, and the response time, as the, as the arrival rate increases, the response time is, keeps steady because the system keeps deploying more and more uh, services on different nodes. You can see that the number of services, those square boxes, so it goes up to two, four, six, and so on. And this, this sort of works until you get to about uh, 12 processes. And then after that, as the arrival rate increases, then we run out of nodes. We've only got 16 nodes, and the system can't cope with this uh, the arrival rate uh, beyond that. So this is another attraction, we think, of having the services in deployable form in a repository, because you can, you can deploy multiple instances of them in order to scale up the performance if, they, if a service becomes popular. And uh, of course, you can then get rid of services if the, if the uh, arrival rate drops. And there's, there's been some work, some, uh, some people in our department are interested in uh, queuing theory and mathematical modeling have done some analyses which show when you should get rid of, get rid of services as well, because they might affect uh, other more popular services. So you're trying to get this balance. You've got a fixed set of nodes. You've got a set of services which people want to use and you're trying to uh, deci decide how to partition up the nodes across them. Hi. Yeah, well, um, once you get to, to, to here, then um, you just haven't got the power, even when you've deployed this service on 16 nodes, to deal with all of these requests as they come in. And so um, at this point, then, you really have to buy a bigger cluster in order to keep the response time at this level for that sort of arrival rate. Yeah. How are you, so how are you load-balancing the load balancing request now or just issuing new endpoints to as requests come in? Uh, so, so this is just round-robin load balancing for this experiment. So, you, so however many deployments there are, you just round-robin the request as they come in uh, across them. So it may be that we could do something more more. Uh, more sophisticated with that. I was just uh, in the 1980s. I worked with a group that did a lot of work on uh, on load balancing scheduling, and uh, people 
people would write PhDs for and study this for three or four years and then discover that um, that random was actually the best approach around robin. So I've always uh, I've never really uh, tried to do anything more sophisticated in that area since. So um, okay, so so that's one bit of the technology. I'll just go to to end. We'll go through a, um, a typical scenario. So uh, this is the sort of thing that we when we looked at the requirements from the neuroscience, this is the sort of thing that they wanted to do. So they start off, they collect from multi-electrode arrays. So this is a multi-electrode array, so, you'd, so that you, you saw the, uh, the brain earlier when the slice was taken off, it would be placed on top of there, and then each of these is individual electrons, and you can read out for them, from them by uh, connecting to these pads around here. Um, they would, the, the neuroscience would want to have a look at the data. They would want to make sure they were getting some signals from it and they might move the slice around if they weren't getting a very good uh, response from it or they might try different drugs or whatever until they were getting something which they felt was worth, worthy of analysis. Then they do the spike detection and sorting that I talked about earlier, working out um, how they thought that the signal which you got was spread around a set of neurons. Uh, they do some sort of statistical analysis to try to work out what the, uh, what the spikes that they'd, uh, they'd identified meant and then they'd visualize the, the results. And then and this was a semi-manual process which involved lots of, um, so we found one group where even for small amounts of data, it took them about a day to analyze it because of doing data format conversion between the data as it came out of the, the electrode array kit and the analysis routine. And they were putting everything through uh, an Excel spreadsheet in small chunks manually in order to do the data conversion. So. Uh, that was one thing that we were able to, to fix. So um, if I go through these very quickly, these stages, so this is the, so, this, so I said that this is about cloud computing and the idea is to move everything to a cloud and every, everything uses a, a browser. So this is the exception that proves the rule. So this is a tool that uh, Jim Austin's group at York built for the DAM project, which is one of the projects that Tony funded, which was about looking at aircraft engines. So actually this, feature here, so, th so uh, in, the, in the, the classic example of this for aircraft engines, this would be a bird strike, so they'd have a particular pattern they identified for a bird strike, they'd want to find all occurrences of it and all the data from the aero engines that they'd collected. But uh, this is actually from, a, from one of those uh, electrode arrays, so you can see these are each of the electrodes in the array and you can see there's a, these spikes here. So the neuroscientists would, would have a look at this and they'd zoom, they'd zoom along and have a look at the, for a through, through the data at various times and just make sure that they were, they were getting signals and that they were happy with it before they decided to, to analyze it. So this is one tool. So this is actually a Windows application, native Windows application that runs on the desktop. And uh, the people at York say it couldn't be put into the, into the cloud because of the, 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 uh, the nature of the interaction with the user and trying to get the data backwards and forwards uh, between the cloud and the, and the tool. So. Um, and this is what uh, you can also do with this tool. So the, the, the uh, Signal Data Explorer, which is the tool that I showed at the top left, then you can kick off searches which are sent very close to the data. So the data is stored in these uh, storage resource brokers, which is a file management system. And uh, you can search for particular patterns, and it moves the patterns as close as possible to the data in order to reduce the amount of information that's being sent in and out of the, in and out of the system. So the idea is that only a small amount of of data should be sent between the cloud and the, the desktop tool. Um, and yeah, so what happens is you kick off these searches and then at any time the, the client can request to have a look at some of the uh, positive results that have been sent back and so the user can then uh, browse through. So, so typically uh, in this case they'll be looking for particular sorts of spike activity. These are multiple deployments of SRB. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you'll, you'll have to uh, talk to Savas about the exact way it works. But uh, yeah, so, the, so basically on each, uh, on each node, uh, on each node you deploy a, a local SRB, which can then, uh, you can then send the, the requests to it. Because my team has never seen anybody who really used SRBs. So right. They disbelieve me. Right. Well, uh, this is a different SRB. Oh, OK. Uh. <laughs> there is SRB here, too. <laughs> Yeah, and so, and the people at York have 
Jim's uh, an expert in different ways to do searching, so they've got lots of different searching techniques which are efficient and, and scale well across a, across a set of nodes. So we define the, the process of, uh, that, the, that the users were doing with a workflow. So it takes in the, the data, it does some analysis. So this is written in R rather than MATLAB. So R is, tends to be used by people who, um, who don't want to use MATLAB because it's proprietary. But uh, not everybody can use R to do what they want, it turns out, because MATLAB comes with lots of libraries which are for things like signal processing, which are actually very useful for what the neuroscientists want to do. And you, you can't do everything with, with R. So in this case, the R code is actually doing some statistical analysis once you've identified where the spikes are. And it produces some outputs you can see at the bottom. Um, so this is an early version of the portal, which uh, uh, we're not uh, usability experts, our, our uh, uh, interface design experts, but it just gives you an idea of what you can do. So um, you can see the data that you have access to on the, on, on the left-hand panel over here, and you can select some data. So in this case, this, the result of this experiment, you can have a look at what workflows are available, and you can click and select to, to run a workflow. And it runs in the cloud, and then you get the results back. So this is one of the graphs that's produced. This is actually showing the... Um, so the density of the, the black line shows the rate of spiking activity at a particular electrode. So you can see this is, this is one of those waves which is flowing across uh, from one part of the electrode or uh, uh, across to another part. And then they also like uh, visualizations. Sometimes quite crude ones, but effective. So this one, which may start on its own, I can't remember. Oh, here it goes. So this is just um, for each electrode. The radius of the circle you can see shows the, the rate of firing of the neurons under that part of the circle. And it is quite, um, uh, you, you can see the, the activity, you can see the flow of the, the activity across a, across a slice quite well like that. It's much easier than if you just got graphs or printouts of numbers. Okay, so just to finish quickly, so um, Carmen is uh, aiming to uh, deliver new results in uh, neuroscience and hopefully computer science and uh, if we can apply some of the, the results of the neuroscience in medicine as well. Um, and we're delivering through an e-science cloud that, although the focus of this talk is beyond neuroscience, our hope in trying to identify what are those common building blocks that you'd want to have in the cloud, our hope is that we'll be able to use them for other sorts of uh, science as well. So uh, one of the, uh, a new project which we have, which is funded, so One Northeast is a regional development authority for the northeast of England, and they've funded a pilot study looking at how you can apply this approach to other sciences. So we've got some money to go and um, look at what scientists do, take their codes, wrap them up as services, put them in the system and provide this sort of system to, to users. And I think I've got another. Yeah, so this is the, this is the, the vision here. So you've got um, basic, your basic set of e-science services at the bottom. Um, you've got some core scientific services that are independent of any particular science. And then in particular domains, so I picked these uh, these four domains over here, because these are four that the Regional Development Authority has said are going to be uh, important for the northeast of England, and they're pumping uh, money into that. They're also interested in building up uh, sets of data and services that can be used for uh, skills and education, both in universities and also in schools in the, in the area. And uh, there's no reason why you, you have to just stick with science services, so we've been looking at some business services as well. So it, it's quite uh, interesting that if you look at... So the northeast isn't a high-tech hotbed uh, of, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the UK. There's, there's odd pockets of expertise, but um, these companies are often small and they, and they struggle to get going. And one of the things that One North East has been trying to do is to make it easy for them, for people to set up companies and to run companies. And there's quite a few um, um, people who will host business applications like these ones here, project management and CRM and so on, for a for a monthly cost for these, for these small companies and the, re and the Regional Development Authority is keen to subsidise that and encourage people to do that, to get off the ground without big investment. So the idea is to make these available as well through the same sort of platform. So, so one of the users in a, in a startup or in a, in a university would log on to the system and then be presented with a set of services that could narrow it down to their particular scientific area, they could look at the business service or whatever, they could they could run them and uh, so that hopefully they could do a lot of their work within this sort of, a, sort of environment without having to invest in, uh, in uh, people or software because um, uh, you know, it, it seems like the upfront capital cost of, start, of 
creating a startup in uh, into science area like bio bioscience can be quite large and hopefully this moving more towards a sort of pay as you go type uh, approach could reduce those costs. I think I've got one more. Yeah. So so this was the this was the hope that that quote at the top that's the hope from from the regional development authority. So they think they can sell it to businesses that could come into the area and just get all the software that they wanted for a for a low cost. Um, they're also interested because we're adding we're adding social networking features into it. So they're always interested because you've got lots of small companies. How do they they build up these relationships between them? How do you build a community? And again, you can you can do that with with that. Um, very last slide, which I'll uh, move on to. So so uh, for a company like uh, such as such as this one that's looking at uh, commercial clouds and so on, then uh, this is. This could address a real problem that, that there is in, in science, which is sustainability. So it's a real worry for us and our users that we've got four years funding and they'll put a lot of effort into writing the applications and uploading the data. And then what happens at the end of the, the four years? We've really got no guarantees. We're, because we're a university, we're really uh, pitching to do research rather than to um, create these uh, systems and, uh, and maintain them over a long period of, of time. So I've been looking at uh, commercial cloud. So, for example, uh, the one from from Amazon at the moment, and whether we could whether we could use that. And the attraction of that is it might save us from using the uh, having to provide our own storage and compute, so we wouldn't have to run our own our own cluster. And um, the idea would be to find some way of moving from the our own private cluster over to use Amazon facilities, perhaps in a controlled way. And there's a local company who actually Savas used to work for it as well, who um, who have We've been doing some work with, and they're looking at this area. How do you move from your private internal cluster over to ex external resources like, like Amazon? So that might be a way over time to migrate off our own system to, to something else. But uh, there's a, it still gives this problem because um, if you look at, back at that stack that I told you about earlier, so we've got this uh, storage and uh, compute needs which a commercial cloud like Amazon could provide. But then this still leaves all of these services in the middle here which we have to build and support and maintain if these uh, users are able up the top are able to use their apps. Yeah, Roger? Why can't you simply package that as a VM that actually runs on those commercial sites? Well, you could, you could do that, but of course it would still need some uh, maintenance and you'd still have to upgrade it and so on. So it's... However, you know, upgrading the VMs or you can even version them so if people need an old VM because their science project's still running. Yeah. I, I think that's... So I think that's a good idea, and, and I think that's the way that you would, you would organize this. But, uh, you know, software seems to atrophy over a period of time if you, if you just leave it. And, um, you know, there's always security patches that need to be applied, or uh, somebody wants to just add in this extra feature. Or, um, you know, my feeling is if we just effectively froze in virtual machines what, what was around at the time, then these users would, would find that it over time it would meet less and less of their needs and they'd, move, they'd have to move to something else. So my feeling is that um, you need some people who are in, in responsible for, for maintaining and supporting it at this level. The, yeah, the, the security services, the workflow services and, and so on. And then the scientists can concentrate on their own services at the top. Yeah. So that's where we see the, uh, the gap at the moment. So. Um, yeah, so, so that's the question at the moment. You know, provide how do we support these, these e-science services? So we've, uh, so we, so we've been looking at uh, whether a company could do this. So we we started to get for the first time in my uh, career, we started to get involved in thinking about whether we should uh, uh, look to have a company which would actually try to provide this, which would look at the full range of things from here to here. But even then, you know, as Roger points out then the more that commercial companies could do in this area here, it would really reduce the amount of effort that you have to do up here in order to provide services for users over a period of time. So that's a company that we're setting up. How does it relate to design for stuff? Oh. And because Steve Andy Keane's company delivering uh, optimization services, cloud services. So there's a I yeah, I didn't know about Simon's uh, work in that area, so we should uh, talk to him, yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's, uh, that's basically it.
Well, let's thank Paul first. People have been asking questions throughout. But any more questions? Well, so then even if you have a company that can set up on deliver mechanics, the problem you have is does the UK university sector feel that this is something, this is infrastructure that they should provision? Because I mean, that's really the, the fundamental problem at the moment is that mm. it seems to be the research council's philosophy is that infrastructure is funded on a per project basis, unless yeah. it's bricks and mortar, in which case that's a university problem. Yeah. Um, so I mean, basically, I mean, it really is a sort of, is there a shift in attitude coming in the, in the wind as to what is being good for research funding? So I don't think that there is, from what I've seen. I think there's, there's pressure from funders now that say that people must uh, make publicly available the results of their projects. But it's not at all clear how you, how you do that. There isn't a, a group out there which could take your data and, and your services. I mean, the, at the moment, a lot of the focus is on data, but really data on its own is pretty, is pretty useless. We could give, at the end of the project, 100 terabytes to somebody who could put it on a on a disk, but it wouldn't be useful. Nobody could afford to download it to, to analyze it. So you really need a, a combination of the two. And we've not seen anything that's, uh, that's there which is, which, which is looking to do that. So he's asking a very profound question. What mm -hmm. about wonderful institutions such as the National Grid Service in the UK? Oh, the their views yeah. Yeah. So, so a few years ago, I suggested that. Yeah, so you're talking about. So, so a few years ago, I, I suggested that, um, that what the National Grid Service should move into would be something which, so, so I kind of took the, the, the Google, um, the, 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 the phrase that Google used to describe them, uh, themselves, which is something like organizing the world's information. And I said that why doesn't the National Grid Service move to be, an, to be uh, something which organized the UK's science information? So it would take not just the uh, codes, which the National Grid Service has the capability to do, the, uh, the OMII, which uh, for those of you not familiar with, uh, with uh, odd uh, UK terminology, so this is a group that, again, Tony set up, which is to, to um, look... <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> that was on its board. That <laughs> okay, so, so there's, three, there's three people who know it very well. But yes, yes. <laughs> This fantastic uh, system, yeah. So, so that was set up to to allow people to um, to effectively take uh, take services that were produced, code that was produced by UK Science Project, and it would get it to the point where other people could download it and install it, and uh, maintain it and produce new versions and documentation and so on. It did a good job of that. So, on the one side, you've got the National Grid Service, which would run things. On the other side, you had the OMI, which would produce software that you could. Um, download and install, um, but really I felt that you know, what's needed now is bringing all this together so there's somewhere where you can have in one place, you can have your data, you can have the services, there's some, there's some group that which will look after those services so that nobody needs to download and install it anymore. And that was the attraction of really moving to the, to the cloud model. It seemed that that was the way the, the computer uh, world was going and you could imagine in that model if you could get some people who would provide these basic services and get the scientists just concentrating on their own uh, specific services up at the top. But I've not seen anything like that that exists at the moment, and that's why we wondered about having to go ourselves to see whether... So the, the first part of this project with, um, with One North East, we'll, we'll be going around scientists at the university and some local companies and seeing whether this sort of cloud model really, really works for them or not. And if, if it does, then... Um, hopefully be able to work out how to provide on a commercial basis. You know, how much does it cost to actually... Uh, so, so the problem with Amazon is that people focus on just the low-level costs of cycles and storage, and they don't concentrate on the costs of maintaining the, the software above it. So I ho I'm hoping this will give us a better idea uh, of how much that would actually cost to, to provide this sort of system to, to users. I went to see the Kepler folks in UC Davis, and they were complaining about how the OMII had made the Taverna code documented and well-engineered, and it was unfair competition. So, so we did achieve something. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and the other one, uh, have you talked to Alex Saleh and his team? They have developed a thing they call S4, which is Simple Storage Services for Science. Okay. So I think there may be some that's a good, interesting yeah, that's a good one. Okay. But to get a talk. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah we're going to talk as well, so I'll, I'll take my, I'll take okay. my question. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, we, we have a project by National Institute of Health, which is uh, called CABIC, that's uh, Cancer Bioinformatics. Yeah. Right. How, how do you compare this concept with that? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> aren't you talking to the burn folks? Yes, yes, in fact, I'm there on Monday. Which is a similar thing to yeah. CABIC. Yeah. I'm on the user end of uh, these sites, and uh, you highlighted that fact right in the uh, start. Uh, for CMA, I will uh, see the major problem area is the medical community, uh, the culture in the medical community is such that you don't want to share your data. Yeah. So have, have they, they have a huge structure in place, but uh, really the usage of uh, uh, CMA is not uh, that much. So that right. will subsequently be a uh, similar problem. If so you think the reason why people don't use it is because they're reluctant to share their, their data with others? Well, that's part of it. That's not actually all of it. I mean, part of it, there's a barrier to entry in regards to actually picking up the technology. Also, um, uh, there are different instantiations of, uh, or levels of participation and hoops that you have to jump through mm -hmm. in order to even become members of CAB. Right. Uh, centers of excellence like Georgia Tech have already jumped through those hoops, but uh, other institutions haven't been quite so fortunate in doing that. And, and also the other problem is that uh, they do tend to focus on the minority areas and not where the most of the uh, actual oncology research takes place, which is 80% of it takes place at the regional level, not at these national centers of excellence, which are actually more academic type institutions. Right. So adoption, actually, is, there's a lot of reasons for lack of adoption, which mm. I think is a completely other issue from, from, uh, from this particular system. I think that this is a great model. Uh, in fact, it's probably a better model than the model in which uh, that system is based. But also, we need to make sure that we do not uh, uh, confuse the concept of putting the data on the cloud and sharing. Just because your data is in the cloud does not mean that you share the data. Or your Google mail is in the cloud, and apart from Google accessing it, no one else, uh, you know, you're not sharing it. But that's the price of it. And because this this has been part of uh, this has been part of discussions we've had with Bern and, and CAB, they, you know there has to be a distinction. But I would be interested to know what users actually use. For Bern, for example, they give all these neuroscientists Globus, uh, Condor, and SRB. Do they really need that? What are, I mean, is that what they want? You know, so I would be interested in if you have some insights into that. And similarly with CAB. I mean, I, I, I've come down to the view after mistakenly pursuing a middleware approach for five years in the UK science program is that we need to do a, a, a web service, cloud service type of approach. Just have us as a This year. Yeah, but what, what's, what's behind the web services? Isn't that middleware behind web services? <laughs> but you don't require the user you to put 800,000 lines of global yeah, software on agree. their server. I quite agree that mm. the use the product. Mm. I, I think, I, I mean, I think, I think that's a danger with the way clouds are at the moment. So people see clouds as being like these, as I've said, these low-level Amazon services. And then in order to do anything, you do actually need to build your own middleware on, on top of that. So I think it's this hole here that's the, that's the problem and who's going to fill that in the cloud. <laughs> well, that would be very nice. Gentleman at the back. Um, so you talked a little bit about Aura and is the data, sort of part of the data analysis piece. I'm not sure what Example, or do you think that Aura is a key part of those stuff that you guys are doing? Um, so, so we, we have that because uh, our collaborators at York, that's their technology and that's their, that's their interest. Um, it's certainly, so it was certainly use, it's been certainly useful in other applications like the, the Aero Engine application. That Dame was a successful project and it was used in Rolls Royce. Um, the neuroscientists really like being able to review their data, so they love the, the Signal Data Explorer tool that I showed. Um, at the moment, it's not clear whether the searching facilities are as useful in that environment as they are in the aero engine environment, because um, searching for spikes uh, with particular characteristics 
is something that some neuroscientists do, but many neuroscientists are actually just happy to accept that any uh, voltage which is below a certain level is a spike. They don't care about the particular shape of the, of the spike. And so you can easily just threshold the data to find the spikes. So the it's, I have, yeah. So um, George Joukowsky down at Caltech is, you know, super interested in doing analyses of, you know, terabytes or petabytes of astro data. Right. And being able to recognize things that you might not even have a heuristic for how to recognize, right? We know that a supernova flare looks like this kind of curve in this particular area of the sky. Okay. And I can imagine trying to do the same sort of thing here. He wants to be able to grow the way that you can even ask questions so that you don't have to say, show me the supernovae. It's, mm -hmm. show me the things that aren't supernovae or anything else but still might be interesting. Right. So being able to, to search across, you know, terabytes of data from a single experiment, it yep. seems like a, a puzzle that it's not going to be like, just find me all of the spikes, because you know, now mm. there's, there's only 40 million of them that you have to review. Mm. Ah. Well, um, so, so I suggested that uh, you, you get in touch with, or they, they get in touch with Jim's group, because uh, they have used this sort of technology in many different environments. So they do facial recognition with it, for, for example. They don't just do this, uh, this sort of spike spike detection or I mean, if I about stress the detection. technology based on was it neural networks or what? Yeah, of? yeah. So they, they, they've done a lot of work on neural networks has been a way. So the correlation matrices that I, that I mentioned, that comes from one of their neural network techniques. And they've, they've got things like they've got accelerator hardware as well to make this, to make this faster if, uh, if the software agents aren't quick enough for the amount of data that you have. So they, they've got a lot of expertise in that. In that they, have a, they have a commercial startup company which I think yeah, Cybula. Cybula, yeah. Cybula. Yeah, B-U-L-A. Yeah. Uh, the, the guy's name is, uh, is Jim Austin, A-U-S-T-I-N. If you wanted to contact him at York University, it's helpful, so he, he would uh, be interested. Biological ontologies in your yeah. um, e science services. Could, are you using those to see if data is from commensurate experiments, or can you say, do people upload their own ontologies or extend existing ones? Or is there anything you yeah. can say? So, so, amongst the neuroscientists that we work with, there's no tradition of using ontologies, and um, very little tradition of. Uh, of having any sort of agreed way to describe metadata. So if I go back to just to one of these slides just to show the, sorry, show the problem, then um, this, yeah, so this, if I can show this. So this was the only metadata before. So we, we produced this to mimic uh, some data that was made available to us. And the only metadata that was available when it was produced was, you can see the title of it at the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and that, and that was it. So you had to know what spiky stuff 0003 was in order to interpret that information. You know what experiment it came from. So, um, so what we've got is we've got people who've been involved in, uh, in bioinformatics, in ontologies, and they've looked at, uh, at neuroscience and they've tried to define, well, actually what they've done is to carry over some of the biological ontologies for experimental protocol and then just fill in the gap with uh, which is the uh, electrophysiological data for which there wasn't an ontology at all. And now we're in the process of doing user trials to see what the users think of this. And of course, it's, uh, it's quite difficult. So, um, you know, on the, on the one hand, I should draw this as a graph, but on the one hand, the more information you get them to produce, then potentially the more shareable and more interpretable their, their data is. But as you go in that direction, the less likely it is that people will actually bother to to, to add it. So we're, we're trying to find where that, uh, that sort of minima is, where people are prepared to provide the data, but it's actually useful um, for, for others to use. So I expect it's going to be a human problem as much as a technological problem. What do you think are we going on? Thank you very much. And let's thank Paul again. Thank you.